The journey that led me to this stage was born of a petty frustration on my part. I'd been living in the Logan Heights neighborhood of San Diego and was feeling a little left out. The neighborhood where I live is lower income, predominantly Hispanic, and historically black. As is usual with such neighborhoods, there's no fancy restaurants, hipster bars, or even Starbucks where I can socialize with my friends. Though I'm Latino myself, I was feeling a little left out. Now, do you all remember the movie The Princess Bride? There's a scene in the movie that I like to keep in mind as I'm working my way through a problem. In the movie, um, uh, Wesley's trying to figure out how to get into the castle to rescue the princess. He turns to his companions and says, if we only had a wheelbarrow, that would be something. Inigo Montoya looks at him and says, well, actually, we got one around here somewhere. Irritated, Wesley responds, well, why didn't you list that among our assets in the first place? And what I love about that scene is that as we're trying to come to a solution, it reminds us to consider all of the resources that are at our disposal, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem, because especially when it comes to art, it's in the small details that big inspiration can be found. So uh, as I was trying to connect with my, my neighborhood, I realized I had three assets right in front of me. First, I'm a photographer with over 30 years of experience documenting people and places. Second, the neighborhood where I live is filled with wonderful people who had their own culture, even if it was different from the, the suburban culture that I was more accustomed to. And third, uh, I had my home. I lived on a, a busy intersection, and I just built a beautiful wooden fence around the house that I was actually uh, eager to show off. So like Wesley, I devised a plan. I decided that I would photograph the people in my neighborhood and then use my home as an exhibition space by placing the photos on the outside of the fence. I got started by photographing individuals who lived and worked uh, in the area. And then as, uh, to test the waters, I placed a couple of, oops, oh, there we go, a couple of oversized prints on the fence. Nervously, I waited in the shadows to see how people would respond. I, I was more than a little afraid that people would actually start throwing rocks at me. Instead, I was relieved to see passersby happily recognizing their friends and neighbors. Uh, is this the right slide? Yeah. So uh, I, I then went on to, um, to place 18 four-foot by five-foot photos on the fence. Word quickly got out. I went from being a stranger to something of a local hero. Local news media came and did stories on the project, which then brought people from all over the city to see the work. There were also small but profound impacts as well. This gentleman had spent his entire career in the Navy. He brought his daughter and granddaughter to view his portrait. As he shared with me his story, tears began to fall down his face. For the first time in his life, he felt validated and recognized. Such is the power of a simple portrait. From this experiment, I saw firsthand the power of portraits to validate our humanity and act as a bridge between communities. I decided to call this project Neighbors because that's what I was doing, photographing my neighbors. I soon began to wonder, however, what would happen, well, after seeing the impact of this one fence and this in this one neighborhood, I soon began to wonder what would happen if I took this idea to a, a bigger stage. I decided to pursue what author Jim Collins has referred to as a BHAG. A BHAG is a big, hairy, audacious goal. It's a goal so big, we may not succeed in accomplishing it, but we have to give it everything just to try. I decided that my BHAG would be to take the Neighbors Project across the country and photograph Americans in and through every state in the country. Over the course of four years, I took my portable studio from Hawaii to Maine, Alaska to Florida. I ended up photographing Americans of all different backgrounds, wealthy, middle income, lower income, farmers, suburbanites, inner city residents, black, white, brown skinned, conservative and liberal, male, female, transgender, and non-binary. I set my camera up in churches and in bars, in soup kitchens and supermarkets, at county fairs and farmers fields, at rodeos and restaurants, 
and even at a packed drag queen graduation ceremony in New Orleans. And trust me, you haven't lived until you photograph drag queens in their element. In the end, I created a body of work that is representative of America. At over 5,000 portraits, my photographic village of this country is larger than many of the towns I photographed in. To create these images, I used studio lighting, a high resolution camera, and a neutral backdrop. This maintains a consistent look and keeps the focus on the individual. I also adopt a low camera position so that the viewer is looking up at the subject. This places the subject in a position of power and respect. No matter what prejudices we carry with us, no one looks down at the people in my photographs. As I traveled tens of thousands of miles road tripping back and forth across the country, I learned that it doesn't matter our background. Americans want to feel connected with each other. We are one people with far more in common than separates us. I also saw how portraits can be a powerful connecting force. When we eliminate the distractions and the artifice, we're able to see the underlying humanity that we all share. As we begin, whoop, went too far. As we, as we begin to appreciate each other's humanity, we're able to feel connected across our geographic, political, religious, racial, and other differences. It's through this process of connecting individuals across their differences that the Neighbors Project works to unite Americans one portrait at a time. Now, in order for us to connect through the work, we first have to see the work. So going back to my original installation on the fence, I realized that I could impact far more people by exhibiting my work in public than I could by just sticking to traditional installations in private spaces. In San Diego, I installed my work outside the Chicano Park Day Festival, where over 50,000 people came to attend. In downtown Oklahoma City, I placed my work outside a bank building, where over the course of a year, tens of thousands of people were able to get to know their neighbors. In New York City, I installed my work along a quarter mile of fence on Houston Street, one of the busiest streets in Manhattan. During the two months that this project was up, hundreds of thousands of individuals were able to meet their fellow Americans from across the country. Again, going back to when I first started this project, I thought that I would use my public work as a way for me to get into the galleries, museums, and other private venues. Instead, what I saw is that I could use my public installations as a way for private spaces to extend their reach, especially to those communities underserved by art institutions. So when the Anchorage Museum of, uh, of Art commissioned me to bring my neighbor's project to Alaska, I broke my exhibition up into three parts. The first was an installation inside one of their galleries. Next, I installed my work on the facade of the museum so that people walking through the nearby park and downtown areas could experience the work. And then finally, we went out into the community and installed the work on a fence far from the museum. In effect, we created a funnel to draw people from outside the museum into the museum. And uh, by the way, this fence was located in a low-income neighborhood and one underserved by art, much like my neighborhood back home in San Diego. So the next time you see a fence, don't just think of it as a means to keep people out. Think of it as an opportunity to show art, as an opportunity for us to connect, to connect with each other, to connect with art, and for us all to connect with our neighbors.